right at the moment when we are needed most. We have faced cutbacks, furloughs, and layoffs. The economic nosedive decimated state and local governments, which means public services have gone on the chopping block for our service and sacrifice. So many AFSCME members are being thanked with pink slips. It's a responsibility of the federal government to step in. And we spent the last several months fighting for a relief package that sends at least a trillion dollars to states, cities, towns, and schools. Funding the front lines is the only way to maintain the public services that sustain our communities. And it's the key to defeating COVID-19 and safely reopening our economy. America needs truth. Our people need healing. Our society needs transformation. But how? We've had commissions before, and we still have not learned the lessons of our past. This time will be different. This time, we will learn from the wisdom of our communities and engage in a national grassroots effort to write a new American story. Ultimately, racism is a belief system. It's an ideology. It's a way of seeing the world. And it is the legacy of that belief system that we live with. The work has already begun in small towns and city centers, meeting in libraries, churches, and on college campuses from Alaska to Louisiana. How do we get over our fixation on this absurd notion of racial hierarchy? Since it was developed by nearly 200 experts in 2016, the Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Framework has been used by dozens of communities across the country with the goal of uprooting the conscious and unconscious belief in a hierarchy of human value. To craft the framework for local TRHT commissions, we drew on the study of over 40 global examples of truth and reconciliation commissions. The framework is simple, but powerful, and it works. Truth, racial healing, and transformation guides folks through a process of learning and unlearning that ultimately creates a new community history, one that doesn't hide the ugly truth and weaves the stories of all local peoples. Over years of experience, practitioners have learned that relationship building by stakeholders in the community is an essential ingredient to overcome divides. On this basis of healing through storytelling and understanding, community members collaboratively craft plans for creating transformational change to the laws, economic rules, and physical structures that keep us apart and unequal. Empowered by a national commission and fueled by grassroots energy, truth, racial healing, and transformation will help usher in a new America that lives up to its highest ideals, where all of us can thrive. what a pleasure it is to welcome you to the Congressional Black Caucus's Foundation 2020 Virtual Annual Legislative Conference and for participating in today's panel. Uh, our discussion and the title of our, of our panel is The Fight for Equality, Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation. So thank all of you for participating with us. Uh, this is the moment for this discussion. And I want to just uh, thank, first of all, our panelists, uh, whom I have known for many years, who not only have worked for transforming this country and addressing systemic racism all of their lives, Dr. Ron Daniels, Mr. Hillary Shelton, Dr. Marcus Hunter, also Dr. Christopher. This is, uh, uh, these individuals on our panelists uh, are talking about really their life's work and how we are coming together now with, with uh, this resolution 
and also my sister, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, who has championed HR 40 uh, for many, many years. Uh, prior to that, of course, Congressman John Conyers. And I was really proud. HR uh, 40, of course, is calling for a commission to study and develop reparations um, for African Americans. Uh, this time uh, is way past due. It, it's a moment now where uh, we're working together with HR 100, my Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Commission, and HR 40 to put together a comprehensive approach to address systemic racism within the historical context of 401 years ago. Of course, we know 401 years ago was the uh, crime, began the crimes against humanity in the United States as it relates to the Middle Passage and the enslavement of Africans on uh, these shores. And so today we're gonna discuss the historical context. We're gonna discuss what um, this effort is all about. And our panelists, again, as I said, this has been their life's work. And I wanna thank you all for participating uh, because our, our movement now, the movement for Black Lives, uh, the movement has dictated that this moment be a moment that we at the Congressional Black Caucus and at the annual legislative conference, we can hone in on the issues and why uh, this effort is so important. Uh, the, our people are demanding it. And so there's no way uh, we could not have this panel. And so Congresswoman Jackson Lee, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, why don't we get started uh, with, with yourself uh, and talk about HR 40, HR 100, how we're working together, what, what this means really in terms of really beginning to address the structural issues that, that um, are manifested each and every day in systemic racism. Recently, we've just, the horrific murders, for instance, of, of African-American men and women, or the disparities uh, as it relates to COVID-19, the unequal housing, the fact that uh, the wage gap is still uh, huge as it relates to African-Americans. You just, can, we can go on and on and on and talk about how systemic racism plays out in the DNA of this country. So. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Sheila, for your leadership. Thank you for being with us today. And it's re really good to see you, my sister, uh, in Houston, Texas. The other thing I just want to mention is doing this virtually is a challenge. And I want to thank the staff. Uh, I want to thank my staff, Shelly, and everyone for pulling this together. Uh, the silver lining in this cloud, I, I think, is that we're being we're able to communicate and talk with more people and help get our message out and, and receive the kind of input and, and uh, advice and comments and ideas from a broader uh, base of people. And so I think that is encouraging. And so we're making a way out of no way. And uh, thank you again, everybody, for being with us. Congresswoman Jackson Lee. Thank you so very much, uh, Congresswoman Lee. Uh, you are right. It is a pleasure to be with you. And uh, in these moments, we can call each other sisters because we are, many people should know that uh, Congresswoman Lee's roots are grounded in Texas and we've never allowed her to either forget it or have we uh, in fact yielded to our pride of her being uh, one of our native daughters. But we're all uh, indigenous and native daughters of the motherland and brothers of that. And that is why I believe the beauty of what we're doing today, the spirit of unity is so very important. I want to say to all of you as panelists, I have honored and respected all of you over the years. Thank you for your respective leadership as I have indicated in acknowledging you. Uh, but it is definitely a point today on this day, September 1st, 2020, that our nation needs healing. It needs racial healing. Uh, and the partnership that Congressman Lee and myself uh, through our legislation and uh, the concurrent resolution 100 and HR 40 is going to set the historic pathway for enormous leadership in this moment of pain. Uh, I celebrated and commemorated uh, the March on Washington in Washington and was surrounded by the many families that are symbolic of the brutality that we have faced through the years because of disparities. Certainly we know the horrors of slavery were enormously brutal. I'm reminded of a uh, civil war action in Tennessee uh, where our black soldiers, our ex-slaves were fighting for the union uh, and they were captured. And the normal process was, Barbara, for them to uh, have the protocols of um, the prisoners of war. Uh, and the Confederacy abandoned that process and murdered 200 plus 
ex-slaves who had the Union uniform on. They were not given the dignity of being soldiers. All of these incidences uh, that we have never discovered or uh, made them widely known uh, play into the need uh, for uh, the commission to not only study but develop reparations uh, for not only the moment of slavery but also the moment going forward. And, and I'd just like to capture uh, language from HR Res, Concurrent Resolution 100, uh, where it says, be a catalyst for progress toward jettisoning the belief uh, in a hierarchy of human value. Uh, that is the indignity that we face today. Uh, we face today an indignity where the disparities are so stark uh, that you can have a young man, a young father, have his t-shirt uh, pulled and a gun put against his skin uh, and obviously no feeling uh, and shot seven times. And if you read the language of H.R. 40, the proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery, uh, its subsequent de jure and de facto impact on African-Americans, racial and economic disparities, and also on living African-Americans today. Uh, that is why we have come together and I believe it is so crucial uh, that we continue to come together, if you will, on working to build uh, healing, transformation, uh, and that stands on the shoulders of H.R. 40, which we move forward uh, to begin the mechanical work of dealing the technical and tactical work of beginning to deal with uh, those solutions that we will craft legislatively, uh, governmentally, because as many of you know that I've said over and over again, slavery was government sanctioned. And because it was government sanctioned, the response has to come from the government. But there is no doubt in this nation, and Barbara has said it many times, and I've watched her as she's reported to us from the United Nations, uh, where they have dealt with this question of international, worldwide slavery, and dealt with this question of the healing. Uh, we're not there yet, but there's no doubt in 2020 after this, um, how should I say, striking experience that we've had in government, this stark uh, government that we can't even recognize, this um, exhibiting of words and actions that have caused people anger and, and hurt, um, we need to heal the nation and we must heal it, excuse me, we must heal it uh, with the leaders who have felt the burden our community, descendants of enslaved Africans, reaching out to white and Latinx and Asian and people of all genders. Um, we have to be at the forefront of healing. And I think what we're doing today with the concurrent resolution, House Concurrent Resolution 100 uh, and HR 40 is going to be the pillows, uh, the mountain builders, uh, the rocks, uh, the river, uh, to lead us uh, into that moment. So I'm delighted to have the ability to work with you, Congresswoman, uh, to listen to your words uh, and to match out legislative initiatives in the very striking words that they have and that we'll be on the other side or either on that mountaintop saying that we have been at the forefront of healing this nation. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Congresswoman Jackson Lee. And let me say I know and, and I feel uh, the spirit of Congressman Conyers with us today. Uh, okay. We have to acknowledge him and how he has, has um, inspired you to carry on uh, not only his legacy but the legacy of our ancestors. And uh, we really I know that this is the moment uh, to, to make this leap uh, and we certainly uh, intend to do that. Uh, there's no going back, no going back. Thank you, I, and I thank you. Just a quick word. I walked alongside his uh, uh, giant structure, not in uh, physical, but certainly in spiritual height. John Conyers believed in this, and I remind everyone, 1989 was when he first introduced this That's legislation. Right. So I know his spirit is with us, and we thank him so much. Yes, Congresswoman uh, Jackson Lee, and I, I believe when he introduced it, uh, I may have been the second or third co-sponsor of that H.R. Uh, 40 in the day. And we took that actually, and I just have to salute my own state of California because yes. when Congressman Conyers introduced H.R. 40, I was able to get the California Democratic Party to go on record supporting it. Uh, that was in either 89 or 1990. 
And uh, now we have in California legislation that is bipartisan that's supporting uh, at least the California Commission on reparations. And that legislation is moving through the process and hopefully that will be signed pretty soon. So as a Texan transplant in California, the Texas California uh, movement is, is really uh, taking hold. And so uh, it's, it's really uh, remarkable how far uh, you have gotten with HR 40 uh, after John's um, passing, who again, we all uh, revere and love and lift up during this moment. Uh, Absolutely. During this moment. Uh, and, and I know his, his spirit is, is guiding us. So thank you again. And you have Dr. Ron Daniels, who was alongside his oh. side and he is alongside our side now. And so I know he'll be dynamic as one of your oh. panelists uh, coming forward. Oh yes, oh yes, and then I'll make, well, I just have to say one thing about Ron Daniels, in terms of Ron and the National Black Political Convention way back in the day, Ron Daniels and Ntongalizi and others put together, Hillary, you remember this? Put together the National Black Political Convention and wanted Ron Dellums to run for president so bad and Ron really wanted to run and we got there in Cincinnati and they said, oh my goodness, let's see. <laughs> how we're going to do this, and le but let's build the movement first. And so, but Ron was a visionary then as he is now and has stayed the course. So thank you so much, Ron. <laughs> let me now ask uh, Dr. Christensen uh, to come forward, who's going to moderate and, and Dr. Chris Christopher, excuse me, thank you uh, so much because uh, you're going to do all of the heavy lifting today, which <laughs> we appreciate, but it's with the spirit of understanding in your history and your background and your commitment to uh, these resolutions and to the future uh, by the Sankofa experience of, of looking back in terms of the historical context that you come today with us. Uh, Dr. Christopher, a social change agent, she's also the former uh, senior advisor and vice president of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and has done phenomenal work uh, around the country, uh, and this has got to be decentralized in our local communities. And Dr. Christopher knows how this movement, uh, because of her experience and decentralizing a lot of the racial healing uh, transformation work in terms of, uh, you know, correcting the damages of the past, uh, filling in the gaps, moving forward on how you address systemic racism at the local level, her experience is remarkable, barring none. And so thank you for being with us and thank you for helping for so many years get us to this point. Dr. Gail Christopher. Good morning and thank you so much, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. I also have to thank Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. You know, you all are, are charting the course. You are standing up in these amazing times. And so I'm honored to be asked to be part of this conversation. I also want to uh, bring in and introduce our panelists. Our panelists are amazing. They have led this country in this work for a very long time. We are honored to have Dr. Marcus Hunter, Hillary Shelton, Dr. Ron Daniels. You all are going to be invited to introduce yourselves more fully. Although your work stands for itself, it probably needs no introduction, but please do take time to introduce yourselves more fully as you answer our first question. And our first question is, why or what is it in your professional and personal lives that motivates you to be part of this discussion today, this discussion of the path forward, truth, racial healing and transformation and justice in the form of reparations for our people in this country. So I invite you to talk about why you're here professionally and personally before we open up for more questions. And we'll start with you, Dr. Hunter, Dr. Marcus Hunter. Thank you, Dr. Christopher. Thank you, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Thank you, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, for me, uh, a lot of it just comes out of my own life. I was formerly homeless. Uh, I survived the war on drugs. My mother is a recovering addict. And in 2012, when I created the hashtag Black Lives Matter, reparations had that on my mind very heavily. And in part, it had a lot to do with this idea 
moving from surviving to thriving. And I think part of what we wind up experiencing, especially as Black people in America, is that we are made to be content with just surviving. And oftentimes that survival doesn't have the support that's necessary and isn't predicated on the truth that being black has put you at a disadvantage in being in America. And part of how we reconcile and rectify that is with a pathway toward reparations. And in my mind, it's not simply just economic reparations, but uh, Dr. Christopher and Congresswoman Lee have heard me say this frequently, but I have this overall acronym of piles like laundry. We have piles of reparations everywhere, political, intellectual, legal, economic, spiritual, spatial, and social. And I think until we're seeing all seven of those things being enacted, we're always going to be in a constant state of survival and we're not allowing for the least of us and the black of us to thrive. Thank you very much. Dr. Ron Daniel. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Christopher, and to this amazing panel to uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee and uh, for having this opportunity. Um, it's a difficult question because I can't remember when I have not been working on, on these issues. And I think that um, uh, when I really reflect on it, um, I think about always my ancestors. <clears throat> we talked about ancestors today. And so there's a way in which um, their suffering, their, 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 their life, um, and their contribution really to this country and on the basis of the free labor, but also all the other kinds of contributions, the resiliency, the constant effort, you know, to, to be about building a people, but also building a nation. Du Bois' just comment about the double consciousness that we experience. You know, these are things that, that drive us. And I'm reminded of Fan Fanny Dohamer saying, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So there's a constant reminder. Um, Jacob Flake's uh, a father at the March on Washington saying, I'm tired. You know, we're hearing over and over again, I'm tired. There's this perennial, persistent undercurrent of structural institutional racism. And most recently, uh, as uh, Congresswoman um, Sheila Jackson Lee has referenced, the senseless shooting of Jacob Flake, and then the athletes erupting and seeing their pain. Now here are grown men, you know, and I think men should cry, I have no problem with that, but very often we don't, but breaking down and crying. And then, you know, the, the, the coach, of the, um, the Clippers, so I, I watch basketball, to see him say, and I'll conclude with this, he said, why do we keep loving America and America won't love us back? Now, he wasn't talking about individuals. He's got white friends and all that. He's saying, look, we have contributed and helped build this nation. And we can go back and talk about the litany of wars and who, Christmas addicts and so forth and so on. You know, every war, America's most patient patriots, and yet somehow, not the individuals, not the personal pe persons, the structures just will not love us back, as reflected in COVID, as reflected in the, in the pandemic of police murders and constant, you know, oppression, grinding oppression that people feel every day. So I just can't remember when I've not been on this journey, but there are always these moments that continue to uh, propel us forward. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Daniels. Hillary Shelton, can you uh, thank answer you very that? Much, same Dr. Question? Christopher, I, I appreciate it very much. An honor to be here with my, my panelists, uh, uh, Dr. Hunter, as well as Dr. Daniels, and certainly uh, my great leaders like Barbara Lee being on this call with, of course, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee as well. A dynamic duo that we've always been grateful, have always been on our side those who have led our struggle and our challenges, those who have stood up. But let me also say, I'm the guy at the NAACP that monitors what the Congress is doing. Among other things, since 1914, the Congress has graded members of the, the NAACP, that is, has graded members of the Congress on how they, how they push for, how they vote for issues that are important to the African-American community and the communities we serve throughout the United States. Let me also say I'm, I'm delighted to be here because both Congresswoman Lee and Congresswoman Jackson Lee always get an A on our legislative report card, meaning not only are they speaking the talk, moving the bills, 
but they're <coughs> folding the way that they shouldn't actually moving the political capital as it should to address the many issues that are so important to the NAACP. Let me say about us, we are the nation's oldest and largest grassroots based civil rights organization. We have units in every state in the United States, but we are still also on military bases in places like Italy, Germany, Korea, and Japan, as the NAACP was so actively involved in integrating our armed services, even at a time that our people, as Dr. Daniels speaking about love, were willing to put themselves, their lives on the line for a country that would not embrace them, that would not provide the same protections that we were fighting for worldwide. So that's why it is important. Quite frankly, we're having a conversation about reparations and we're having a conversation about reconciliation. As we talk about Congresswoman Barbara Lee's bill, we're talking about really addressing the issues and challenges that are still very much between those who are part of the diversity that we call the United States of America. Those that for some reason or another, if you're in Ferguson, Missouri, would look at an 18-year-old black kid and determine somehow or another he is not human. If you go back and look at the, uh, the transcripts the grand jury, what you'll see is a police officer saying, when I looked in that kid's eyes, would even call him a kid. What I saw is someone that didn't seem human. What he described was something much more like a shark, making it possible for him to kill an unarmed 18 year old that was actually scheduled to begin school, college, his first year as a freshman in college the very next week. As you look at what's happening more recently, things, things have not gotten better, they continue to get worse. We have to ask the question, why is it this would look at what's going on across the country. Those who are paid for with our tax dollars as well would put us to death almost summarily, as is going to happen too often. Grab the back of a man's t shirt that's trying to get to his kids that are sitting in his car and begin shooting in the back over and over and over again. Also, watch the video footage from a man who was complying with the police officers that are put in handcuffs behind his back, laid on the street and a knee to his neck to hold, to stop him from breathing and to stop the blood from flowing. In essence, we know the problem is bigger because as we take on the individual challenges, we can deal with an individual case, take a police officer off the street, but we will know that another incident along those lines is going to happen again. And that is why we're just delighted to get behind H.R. 40 as we have from the very beginning with Congressman, Congressman uh, John Conyers, and his very helpful uh, leadership during the, his entire time in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Of course, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee is carrying that bill for us. I know also supported by Congressman Barbara Lee. But Congresswoman Barbara Lee, we also want to thank you because your leadership recognizes that this issue is bigger than these individual cases. That is much more involved, that is much more part of the, the overall fabric of our country. It's not an individual anomaly. What we're looking at is quite systematic. If we're going to do a systematic assessment, we're going to have to look at each of these cases along those lines of reparations and slavery in the United States and see there is a direct correlation. As we look at what's going on, the thing that ties us all together, as we think about what's going on in our country, when we think about what was slavery was and the rights and protections taken away from us being brought as we were then, but even as we pass amendments to the Constitution, we still have not changed the reality of Americans in our country. So Congresswoman, I will stop there. Let me just say the NAACP and our 500,000 card carrying member membership, our 2200 membership units are strongly behind it. We know that this is the way we're going to have to go. We've looked at other uh, people in our country. We've looked at what happens with our Native American friends and how they've had to take on issues of reparations and reconciliation with our Japanese American friends and the internment issue and seeing how, again, they've had to do the same thing. It's time for us to, to move forward in a structured manner to make sure we pass the legislation, create the structures, and begin moving forward to finally solve problems, hold those accountable after they've been retrained and make sure that our nation lives up to its promises, its constitutional foundation of equal protection, equal opportunity under law. Congresswomen, Thank we're fired up and ready to go in NAACP lingo. Thank you all so much. And this is such a powerful panel. Let me remind you that we have together collectively about 20 minutes to, to drive our points home. So I'm gonna invite each of you to be as succinct as you can in consideration of the fact that we're all on this panel. Uh, I just wanna pick up a couple of points that you raised all of you to drive us to the next question. Now you pointed out so well that black people and 
others of color are just not seen as human beings, right? That there is this belief, this persistent ideology of a hierarchy of humanity. And people, black people are placed at the bottom of that to the point where we are often not seen as human. And so when we talk about truth, racial healing and transformation, we're really talking about eradicating that belief as well as its consequences. But that belief system gives permission for this continuation of structured and institutionalized racism. And it shows up not just at the individual level in terms of the people who pull the triggers, who ignore the health needs, but also in our institutions and in our literature and in everything about this country has been based on that fallacy. And we don't believe that in America, Reconciliation is, is quite the connotation because it means coming back together. And you know, we've never been together. This country was built on that fallacy. So we believe that a, a comprehensive systemic truth process will lead to a transformation that jettisons, for want of a different term, that ultimate fallacy, that ultimate contradictory idea that somehow humanity can be grouped in a hierarchy of human value. But I'm going to invite each of you as panelists to talk about why truth processes are important to creating sustained change in this country. Because we, you know, we have a way of reversing all of our attempts, you know, depending on the political winds, as it were. So, so let's talk about why truth processes are required or necessary to sustain change. And I'm going to invite Dr. Hunter to start us on that. And each of you take about two minutes to answer that question, please. Yeah, thank you for that. I would say uh, just expanding on your point about the fallacy of human hierarchy is that that is the original coronavirus. And as we know with coronavirus, it specifically targets black people and kills them discriminately. And so if we think about the coronavirus pandemic as a metaphor for not only just enslavement, but also the language and narrative about black people that's given permission as you go forward, then you have a clearer understanding of why Black people are so vulnerable and why we are not simply complaining, we are asking for our rights to be valued. And one simple way to think about it, for example, is even when the government has attempted to make some kind of change, we could think, for example, just after 1865, you get the Freedmen's Bureau Bill and also the Freedmen's Bank. Now, fast forward with those things, the Freedmen's Bank is closed less than 10 years later, holding approximately, by today's estimates, upwards of a billion dollars of only Black people's money. When that bank is doing really well, in true America fashion, the bank is then changed so that lending and credit can be given to white people, not Black people, and then that bank quickly goes into bankruptcy, leaving then appointed manager and president Frederick Douglass holding the bag, as we say now in the culture. And so part of why I bring up that story is because if we don't have the truth, then we only think about Black people as having all of these subverted narratives about humanity, when in fact, it's not that we necessarily lack financial literacy, but we have a repeated pattern of financial abuse. And thus, as we go forward, we may not trust the bank. So for other people, it looks weird to go to a check cashing place, but without the truth of our history, you don't understand how our humanity has been violated and abused by financial institutions. And over time, we have a pattern of distrust that is not about illiteracy, but instead about our history. And if we can all know that, then the virus, the coronavirus, the humanity virus has less power. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunter. I love your metaphors. You're really, uh, you're really creative and good with that. Dr. Daniels, would you weigh in on why truth processes are needed and to help us sustain our change? Yeah, let me uh, just uh, appreciate uh, Dr. Uh, Hunter for his presentation because I think that there's a perception that truth telling is somehow necessary for others. See, from my perspective, what he's just outlined is that truth telling, particularly given the nature of the experiences of Africans in America, which were different than any other African people, by the way. I don't have time to go through all that, except Malcolm said of all the crimes committed against uh, uh, Africans by Europeans, the worst was to take our names. We have suffered from a kind of internalized oppression, unlike any other group. And we can come back and talk about that. So we must first believe ourselves. 
And there's a way in which the interruption of our history through various means says that sometimes we are blaming ourselves for things that we are not responsible for. So at the end of the day, as important as narrative and truth telling is power. But you don't build power unless you empower yourself to believe in oneself, to aggregate and build the necessary unity in order to move forward. And that's the kind of thing that has been built. For example, on, on, on reparations, you know, I was, I was, my brain was operated by Queen Mother Moore. She said she was a brain surgeon on, operating on constipated mind. Mine was constipated. She operated and thank God she did. But when she was at the Gary Convention standing in that hallway talking about reparations, reparations, the percentage of black people who believed in it was about 13, 14%. Through our combined movement over the years, it is now up to 80%. Now, what that means is there are thousands of people in the streets. And so where, where it applies to our allies, we do need allies across the board. But now we can look at telling the truth so that a percentage of people, be they white, Latino, Asian, and otherwise, but in some instances, particularly white allies, can come to the forefront and join in this struggle. But that's based on first and foremost, our internalization of it, our empowerment of ourselves, and understanding at the end of the day, it is power more than anything else that will do the transformation. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Hillary Shelton, could you respond to that? Thank you, Dr. Christopher. What's great about being in the position I'm in right now is that in true Washington speak, I can associate myself with the comments of my colleagues, that is Dr. Hunter and Dr. Daniels. So I strongly agree with both of them. You have to talk on both of these issues as well. Let me just say that one of the challenges we have is that too often promises have been made, promises have been broken. We're we talking about 40 acres and a mule, full participation, being able to live in any community we want to, attend any college or university, our minds would take us. We know, as we even talked about things like creating inheritance, that we've been attacked along the way and very well those promises. So it is not extraordinary for African-Americans to think that that's going to happen yet again. That's been the pattern. That's been, been locked up, but we've learned some lessons along the way as well. Let me just say that we understand that doing the same thing over and over again in the same way really is the clinical definition of insanity. To move forward as things work in this country and throughout the world, we're going to have to put things down very seriously. And that is we're going to have to have the research in place. We're going to have to have the laws restructured and put in this position in which they can be enforced. So when talking about reparations, we're talking about damages that were done. In this country, if you are damaged, if you're in a car accident, it's someone else's fault, they pay for the repair to your car. If someone else is to be blamed, what's happened to you, your house was burned down and you lost a place to live, indeed, that needs to be addressed very directly for you. But we also have to take on the institutional implications because we see these things happening to individuals and we know they're part of a pattern and a practice. That's why we need both pieces of legislation. They're very, both very, very important. Reconciliation means a clear understanding of what's happened between people in this country, what's happened between a people and even its government in this country. And that's why we need that. And we have to do a serious assessment of individuals that are those who are the descendants of slavery. Dr says it so much more eloquently than I can ever begin to, but I understand the concept. And that's why NAACP is strongly behind H.R. 40, as well as we are behind reconciliation. Thank you very much. You know, these are unprecedented, I believe, in terms of in our lifetimes, times of, of political division. Uh, these are times that we probably never thought we would see. I'd love for each of you to, to relate our conversation today to this climate, to this time of political division, and to offer advice or guidance. I'm hoping this is going to be viewed by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, and you are wise, sage leaders. And so if you can offer some thoughts of wisdom and guidance as to how we move this agenda, this urgent agenda forward, during these times of such political division. So I'm gonna uh, invite you to go first, uh, Hillary, because I know this is, this is what you all do at the NAACP, so please. Oh, thank you very much. Like, like everything else, we're, we're hearing from our people across the country. As I mentioned, the NAACP has over 500,000 card carrying members and we are in every state. As we learn that the challenges that are happening to our people, whether they're happening in New York or happening in California, whether it happened in Washington State or happened in Florida, every place in between, 
we know that they impact communities in very similar ways. And we have to hear what's going on. So we also look at the cultural diversity. They're still very much a part of our country as well. So the we're organizing around this is that we're endorsing both bills. That means we've educated our members on the bills. We've trained them on the legislation. We've given them the talking points, the sample letters, keep everyone on the same page because we also know there are those that are going to come in and try to interfere. They're going to try to confuse and create problems for us to move forward. We're going to move forward and recognize the problems that we had in the past. And the way we solve those is by educating, making sure our people are given the power to be able to go to the polls to vote for those who will support this agenda. Those who are contacting each of the 435 members of Congress, 100 members of the U.S. Senate to support this very important piece of legislation. And those institutions that are very much part of the MOUs of the NAACP from religious institutions to our fraternities and sororities to professional institutions, agencies, and otherwise make sure they all understand how this impacts us in so many different ways. As a matter of fact, if there's any indication or measurement of how well we're doing and not doing in the United States, and we're looking at those issues and thinking about African Americans, we know that there's a disparate impact on as a community of people and understanding how these pieces of legislation work to help will work to help us address those problems is something that's crucially important as well. We want to solve the problem and bring fairness. All right, thank you. Dr. Hunter, I know you might speak to a to a younger audience. Could you offer some words of, of wisdom and advice? I know you speak to all audiences, but you have a particular resonance to the younger audiences. Can we hear from you on this in terms of advice and wisdom? Yes, no problem. I think a couple of things. I've been really emphasizing the power of words that begin with R-E. And so, for example, right now we hear a lot of protests and campaign from young people around defunding the police. And there is great reason to see why people are in that direction. But what I encourage thinking about a kind of reparative framework is to think about refunding Black communities for their police. A defund just tells me what you're not going to pay for. A refund tells me where the money is coming. As a poor black kid growing up in South Philly, I know that Juneteenth is an amazing time, but what I will tell you is the National Black Holiday growing up for me was refund season. It brought out the joy, the jubilation, and the prosperity that we all hope for all year long. And so I think when we think about the power of words like recovery, reflection, restoration, Reparation, all of these words go together and help us really think about how we can be a better self and also have a better country that is more inclusive, that has reassessed itself, that has documented the harms and located it in a place where we can all find it so we can stop telling Black people that they're crazy or we can stop having conversations amongst Black people about calling this era slavery times. I don't know what that means. You know, it's, it's, it's current. It's not just times. So I think really getting into a place where we're willing to do that work to restore ourselves, restore the country, repair ourselves and repair the country. And we live in a country that can afford it. So when I think about America and reparations and restoration, I think about it as a mansion with many rooms. And what is odd to me is that America can afford to renovate, RE, renovate the entire house. But for whatever reason, we allow them to just fix a tile here, fix a panel here, fix this here. Meanwhile, there are leaks coming through every bedroom, every bathroom we can see. So the point here is to restore, recover, and repair everything because we can afford it. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Daniels. And we are running out of time. So uh, uh, see, if you I could guess. offer us some wisdom and guidance, please. I see we're running out of time. I'm having flashbacks. Uh, I got to take you to listen to Queen Mother Moore because uh, Queen Mother Moore used to talk about why we shouldn't call ourselves Negroes, because Negro, she says, is the N-E is no, not never. She said, I'd rather be a regro than a Negro, because re is restore, revitalize, rehabilitate. So teach, brother. I like that. Um, well, let me just say finally that um, I think that these two bills are necessarily are necessary psychologically for our people to move forward. And I think that particularly we have to focus on not the probable voters. Uh, what Hillary is pointing out is the, the, the fraternities and sororities, the, the, the bad nine, whatever they call it, they're going to take care of business, the churches. But there's a blocks of young people who have not participated, and even some who are, who are skeptical. They, they, 
they hear uh, one negative thing and they get turned off and whatever. I mean, can you imagine the psychological impact of the passage of these two resolutions prior to the election? And let me just say this, even if they can't pass the Senate, that, that's, I, I wanted to pass the Senate, but in order to get rid of Agent Orange, which is another infection and, environment, and, and virus, we need to be able to march on ballot boxes like never before. And I think hearing and seeing with reparations being everywhere that these resolutions have actually hit the floor and passed would give an added incentive for people to march on ballot boxes, a black multiracial rainbow wave that will help purge this country from the, pan of, uh, the, 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 the coronavirus that my dear brother, Dr. Hunt is talking about. So we say forward ever, backward never. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to thank you all because you have certainly reminded us of the power of sustained leadership and courage and the ability to, to stand and to move forward in spite of the odds. Uh, we have two amazing bills that are there, uh, two amazing pieces of, of legislation, and we have tremendous co-sponsorship in the Congress. And for that, we, we thank our two leaders, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, Congressman Conyers, and the leadership of, I remember Ron Dellums oh so well, uh, the, the leadership of so many of us who have said no to the fallacy of a hierarchy of human value and have stood up to assert our equal humanity for all of these decades. So I think this is a time when we could really transform not only the narrative, but the ultimate reality. We, could, we can put an end to this contradiction and to these lies that devalue us. I'm trying to be a good moderator and honor our time limits, and I believe that we are completely out of time at this point. But I just want to say thank you to all of you, and it has been my privilege to be on this panel with you and to listen to your wisdom and guidance and to have a chance to share with the in the courage that you continue to exhibit to help heal our nation and move us forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you.